You probably wondered, how do they solve super hot problems, like proving the famous Fermat's last theorem? And maybe if not for the complete set of cases, but could we get a sense of how the theorem is proven at least in some instances? Well, today we are going on such a journey. We will explore the proof of Fermat's last theorem, not for all, but nevertheless for a wide variety of cases. But let's first remind ourselves very briefly what Fermat's last theorem is. It basically states that for all n higher than 2, the following equation does not have a solution in positive integers. Solving this problem took over 350 years. A large number of mathematicians tried to solve it, including very famous ones and some who became famous precisely due to giving this problem a try. The problem was first proven for n equals 4 by Fermat himself, and then subsequently by other mathematicians for n equals 3, 5 and 7. And then more and more exponents were tackled until in 1994 Andrew Wiles provided a complete proof ultimately published in 1995 and that concluded this absolutely fascinating adventure. Let's get started. First, in Fermat's equation we can legitimately assume that x, y and z don't have common divisors, because if any two of them had a common divisor r, then so would the third one, and we could divide both sides of the equation by r to the n, and get an equation with new numbers that don't have any common divisors left. Next, if Fermat's last theorem is true for a certain exponent n, it's automatically true for all its multiples. How so? Very simple actually. Let's say m is a multiple of n, and let's say that the theorem is true for n. If we assume that it doesn't hold for m, then there are three positive integers x, y and z, such that x to the m plus y to the m equals z to the m. But m is a product of k and n, and so we can rewrite our equation as follows. And if we denoted x to the k as a, y to the k as b, and z to the k as c, we get a solution to Fermat's equation for n, which contradicts with our initial assumption. Now, if we have any n higher than 2, splitting n into multipliers and then again and again ultimately stops at the point where we get to the prime factors of n. This means that to prove the theorem in general case, it is enough to prove it for n equals 4 and all prime numbers n higher than 2, and the rest will follow. That is why proving for Maslow's theorem for prime numbers is so important. And that's what we are going to focus on today, a proof for a significant subset of all prime numbers. And just to reflect the fact that the exponent is prime, we will use p from now on. So p is a prime number higher than 2. Let's divide both sides of the equation by minus y to the p. We can do this because if y could only be 0, then that would prove for Maslow's theorem automatically. So we assume that there are non-zero values and for those values we can do this. Now since p is an odd number, we can bring the minus sign under the power of p. And right now we will only attend to the left side. Let's denote minus x over y as t. As follows from the fundamental theorem of algebra, this polynomial has exactly p, generally speaking, complex roots and it can be decomposed into the following product. But what are those roots? Well, one of them is obviously a 1. Now, can all the rest of the roots also be 1? If that was the case, then this is what we get. But that's impossible, because if t equals 2, for example, we would get that uh, 2 to the p minus 1 equals 1, or 2 to the p equals 2, which cannot be the case for our p that is a prime number higher than 2. So then there are other roots than just one. Let's denote one such root as zeta. Gosh, don't we love Greek letters? So obviously zeta to the p equals one. But how about zeta square? Well, clearly it's also a root because of this. Also, quite clearly, zeta square doesn't equal zeta. 
n doesn't equal 1 either, otherwise zeta would be equal 1. So it's a new distinct root. Well, by the same logic we can see that these are also new and distinct roots. So our polynomial then can be factored as follows. This polynomial, by the way, is called cyclotomic, which literally means dividing a cycle, as tomos in Greek means a slice or a part. And that's because the roots, which are called roots of unity, actually divide the unit circle on a complex plane into p equal parts. Now we can go back to the original variables x and y. Remembering that number p is odd, we can rewrite this equation as follows. This decomposition was first obtained by Gabriel LeMay back in 1847. Now, why is this equality so important? Because now we can substitute the right side into Fermat's equation and this is what we're getting. And this identity will be crucial to the proof. But notice that the left side of the equation contains elements that are no longer plain old integers. Those numbers now contain zeta and its powers. To be able to have meaningful arithmetic, we need a structure similar to z, the set of integers, but containing zeta and all its powers. And when we say similar to z, we mean that just like in z, for any two numbers, the sum will still be in z, and the product will also be in z. In algebraic terms, we say that z is a ring. And we're trying to construct another ring that would extend integers to also contain zeta and all its powers. But that's actually very simple. This ring obviously contains all powers of zeta. And because it's a ring, it should also contain the integer multiples, like these. Or more generically, all numbers of the following form. And since addition should also keep us within the ring, all numbers of the following form are going to be in our ring as well. Finally, let's not forget that we can also add integers themselves to such numbers. And that concludes the picture. It's very easy to see that numbers of this form constitute our new ring because a sum or a product of any two numbers of this form yields a number of the same form. We will denote this ring as z zeta, an extension of the ring of integers with the root of unity zeta. This new ring has a lot of properties similar to z itself. For instance, it has the same notion of divisibility. We say that number a from z zeta divides b from z zeta if there exists another number c from z zeta such that b equals a by c just like with good old integers in z. And similar to our good old integers, the new ring has prime numbers, which is numbers that don't have any non-trivial divisors. But here's also a first surprise. p, the number that was prime in z, is actually no longer prime in z zeta. How about that? In this new ring, there is a prime element 1 minus zeta, which divides p. Actually, even its p-1 power divides p. There is no magic about this. Let's illustrate this on an example when p equals 3. Let's simply calculate this expression. After expanding, we obviously get this. Now, look at that part, 2 zeta. It feels like we want to get a 3 somewhere here, ultimately, to show that the expression divides 3, right? So, let's make it a 3 by subtracting and adding another zeta. And let's move that fancy part to the back, because why not? Now, look at the front portion. Guess what happens if we multiplied it by 1 minus zeta? Let's expand the product. Now, zeta is a third root of unity, so zeta cube equals 1, and zeta to the fourth is just zeta, and zeta to the fifth is zeta square, which means that this product equals zero. But one minus zeta isn't zero, so it should be the other part. And then we get this. Final stroke, multiplying both sides by minus zeta square, gets us what we wanted. Now let's get back to our equation where we left off. The further proof traditionally splits into two cases. Case 1 is when p does not divide either of the numbers x, y, or z, and case 2 is when p divides at least one of them. 
It turns out that in case 1, any two factors on the left have no common divisors, or as they say are pairwise relatively prime. Look at the right side of the equation. The right side is a p power of a number. But because the factors on the left have no common divisors, one would naturally expect that each of the factors itself is a p power of some number. But that, by the means of quite a laborious chain of arithmetical transformations in z zeta, happens to contradict with the fact that z is a root of unity. Case 2 is somewhat different, but utilizes similar logic based on decomposition of the left side. And this would have concluded the proof of Fermat's last theorem for all primes. And actually, that's what Lamey believed was the case. But it turned out that he was wrong. <laughs> we just said one would naturally expect that each factor on the left is a p-power. Strangely enough, there is nothing natural about that. It's a flaw in our thinking. See, we got really spoiled by the ring of integers z. In Z, we have what is called unique factorization. That means that a number can only have one decomposition into primes, up to the order of multipliers, of course, and invertible elements of ring Z, which are 1 and minus 1. But with Z zeta, the situation is different. For some p, it supports unique factorization, for others, not. Yes, you can always decompose a number into a product of primes, but this decomposition is no longer unique. There can be multiple representations that involve different combinations of primes, still yielding the same number. And the lowest p where z zeta does not allow for unique factorization is 23. In this particular ring, 2 is a prime element. For the following two numbers, a and b in z zeta, it turns out that 2 does not divide either of them, but it divides their product, which is really peculiar if you think about it. So yes, we can use our method to prove Fermat's last theorem for prime numbers below 23, but that's pretty much it. Sometime later, however, Ernst Kummer salvaged the situation and managed to utilize the equality that Lamey Yippee! came up with, but with a fancy twist that actually changed the trajectory of algebra and number theory and ultimately shaped a big part of modern abstract algebra. To understand how Kummer did it, we're going to need a simple but very helpful construct that we will define by example in integers z. Let's pick a number, say 3. This will denote all multiples of 3, which is numbers like 3, 0, minus 3, minus 6, 6, 9, minus 9, minus 12, 12, 15, and so on. Adding any two multiples of 3 is also a multiple of 3. Multiplying any element from z by a multiple of 3 gives us, once again, a multiple of 3. In other words, the set of multiples sustains addition within and withstands multiplication from within or even outside. Here's one important observation. The fact that number 3 divides number 6, for instance, is equivalent to saying that the set of all multiples of 3 contains the set of all multiples of 6. Moreover, for two numbers, let's say 2 and 3, we can define the product of their sets of multiples in the following way. First, we get all possible products of the two multiples and then, just to ensure that our set sustains addition, we will also include all sums of the elements we just obtained. It's actually easy to see that the following is true. This looks a lot like an equality of numbers, but is in fact an equality of sets. This set factors into a product of these two. And just similarly as with numbers, we can say that this set, for example, is prime, in a sense that it doesn't factor any further, just like prime numbers. Kummer called any such set an ideal number. Today we just call it an ideal and that's the terminology we'll stick to. In a very similar way, we can define ideals for any ring, like z zeta. Any subset of the ring that satisfies conditions 1 and 2, in other words, that sustains addition within and withstands multiplication from within or outside, is an ideal. And ideals of any ring can be multiplied and their product will also be an ideal, just like in our little example. 
So here's why we deeply care about ideals, and as a matter of fact, why we call them so. It turns out that for p equals 23, and for a broad variety of other prime numbers, even though unique factorization doesn't hold for elements of ring z zeta, it nevertheless holds for its ideals. And that basically allows us to utilize Lamey's formula pretty much in the same way. Only instead of numbers, we use ideals generated by those numbers. But the conclusion is the same, and Fermat's equation does not have positive solutions, which is exactly what we needed. Prime numbers, for which the corresponding ring z zeta allows for unique factorization of ideals, are called regular primes. So, 23 is a regular prime. In fact, the smallest irregular prime is 37, and then we're good again till the next irregular one, which is 59, and so on. There's plenty of regular primes, and that's where Fermat's last theorem can be proven using this method. As a matter of fact, it has been conjectured that there are infinitely many regular primes, and that regular primes constitute over 60% of all prime numbers. But this conjecture remains unproven to this day. The techniques that we considered today did not only help to significantly advance in solving this tremendously hard problem, but also gave birth to ring theory as we know it today. Today, the notions of a ring and an ideal are some of the most fundamental concepts in abstract algebra. But they emerged, as it often happens, in response to a serious problem where all existing methods failed and a qualitative breakthrough was needed. And such a breakthrough happened. Thank you for watching. If you find this video helpful, please hit the like button, share it with friends, and subscribe to my channel.